<laughs> I'm live on YouTube. And there's 10 of you legends in here. Look, I just finished tutoring. So you're propped up on a biology textbook. We've been learning about plants, transpiration and translocation. Does that bring it all back from GCSE biology? Xylems and flumes. Um, and it's lovely to see you. So um, I am here tonight to tell you all about the things that I have been doing that are coming up for me. And hopefully some of you have come over from Instagram so you know me already. Some of you might come over from different places. Tell me in the in the chat where you might have come from. And some of you will leave and some of you will come back and that's fine. And please do pop any questions in the box. M, my amazing apprentice and friend is in there who will reply or tell me questions to answer. Firstly, I'm coming to you from Falmouth in Cornwall, um, the very southwest of the UK. And if you're in the UK or in Cornwall, you'll know exactly where I am. And Cornwall forms the basis of my whole life, but also my next adventure. So um, I'm actually coming to you from a very cool place, which is my co-working space that I've been working in a bit for the last month or two. I have another couple of months here. It's called Fastnet House. It's really very lovely. But no one's here. Everyone's gone home. So I'm out of the little quiet room of doom I was going to chat to you in. And um, I'm now in full break. So look how lovely it is. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you hear from Instagram, you'll know that I actually have disappeared a bit from Instagram posts and writing all my heartfelt thoughts like I used to in the last maybe six months or so. So I thought this might be like a, quite a good time to kind of summarize where I got to and what I've been doing. So the last time I was ever posting really regularly and sharing stuff on posts was uh, with a hike, especially was the CDT last summer. Now, I'd spent all of lockdown desperate to go and do the CDT. Well, actually, my first plan before I got locked down, when I came off the Appalachian Trail at the end of 2019, my foot was broken, which we hadn't realized on the trail. I've been told it was um, tendonitis. But it was actually broken, which is no wonder it was so painful. And if you've read the book, you've read some pretty visceral descriptions of that. Um, and I had to sit down for like two or three months to let it rest. And by the time I was well enough to walk distance again, I started to do the southwest coast path in the rain and, and the mizzle of Feb late February, early March. It was too dangerous and slippery and muddy and stormy to carry on. So I stopped and thought, right, so I got on over Christmas and got my PCT southbound permit, waited in the queue with like my laptop and phone to get a place which go like gold dust, the PCT permit. Southbound, not so many people go, just like the AT, so it's a bit easier to get a permit, but still took time. And then I decided I'd come straight off the PCT and I would go and hike the length of New Zealand on the Te Aurora Trail. And obviously none of those things happened because lockdown happened. So when I was locked down and I couldn't exercise and now with a later diagnosis at the end of last year, I realized that not moving my body and planning trips and moving and flying between places, or getting trains, always being active and moving and doing something, when that stopped, felt pretty stressed out. So I decided to live vicariously in my brain on an adventure. So I wrote the book about the Appalachian Trail, which I'd always wanted to do, write my book, but it was the perfect time. So I did that in lockdown all the time thinking, I'll do something even bigger and better when lockdown is released. And for me, it became the CDT, the hardest of the Triple Crown. And I'll go southbound on the CDT. And I'll really show myself what I can do because I had to wait for so long to make it happen. I did get to do the Southwest Coast Path in that time, which was really great. You know, that was um, this, that same summer in 2020. Through the summer months, it wasn't particularly busy because it was uh, COVID, not lockdown at the time, but um, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. Um, but it was still quite quiet on the trails and being outdoors was a good place. You didn't pass it on so easily or contract it so easily. So um, that was great. But by the time lockdown finished, I wasn't physically in the condition that I was when I finished the AD, which was the last time I'd done a big hike. The Southwest Coast Path was hard. The elevation's crazy. But it had been a while before since I'd done something really physical. So I was not in peak physical shape uh, to hike the CDT. But that wasn't kind of part of the problem when I got to the US. It was that I had to wait in Mexico for maybe 
it was two weeks you had to be bef- somewhere like that before you're allowed in the US and Mexico is incredible and wonderful and beautiful but I was very isolated there waiting to get into the US to start my amazing CDT adventure and um, actually I was going to meet two amazing people um, Little Skittle, Becca and Julia Sheehan, Rocket who uh, Julia is currently on the PCT going northbound with her boyfriend and Little Skittle has just started the CDT like four days ago both of them have brilliant vlogs so if you want to follow them doing their amazing hikes I'm I'm stoked for them they're such awesome women and um, so I was going to meet them I went to the airport in Mexico you will have seen this all of my stuff desperate to get there and typical me I didn't understand quite why at the time with my brain but I had everything with no real window for like fuck up factor I had to fly into uh, Seattle stay the night in a hostel and then immediately get on a two-night or a night sleeper train to take me to the center of the U.S. to Glacier National Park right up by the Canadian border and then we're going to get a ride which we'd kind of organised, a place I'd organised for us to stay. We were all going to meet in Glacier. And then we'd be driven to two and a half hours up to the Canadian border, no other way of getting up there. And it was still snowing, so lots of the through passes weren't open into Canada, so you had to pay someone to take you to drive back again. Um, so those rides were, were important. Hard to get and uh, expensive, and you didn't want to let people down by not being there for them. And then, of course, the Mexican border police would not let me board the plane because the rules of 14 days in um, Mexico didn't mean 14 days. <laughs> Fuck. What the rules meant was that it had to be like 14 clear midnight to midnight period so I'd arrived very early on a plane from England at like 7 a.m on day one and then I was leaving in the evening on what I considered was then to be like day 15 but it meant that I was a few hours short of a zero to zero 24 hour period so they wouldn't let me which meant missed the flight to Seattle missed the train across the country, missed the accommodation that I had booked in Glacier, um, and I was in a, had a bit of a meltdown, um, a fairly civilised meltdown, just a, you know, a small tier kind of situation. So I had to stay an extra day or night in Mexico, but everyone rallied, uh, someone, one of us had also booked the wrong train, that wasn't me, so they missed it too, so I didn't feel quite so bad. Um, one of those girls, we guess which one that was. So got there, but there's quite a lot of stress involved. And I think actually going back into something, big travel, Mexico, into the US, even though I've traveled a lot all of my life and I'm very comfortable with flowing and moving between countries, um, it doesn't bother me at all to sit or sleep in a bus station, you know, a safe, busy one, but or to like take overnight flights or ferries and transport and transit for me is fascinating in itself, all the amazing people uh, that you meet when you're in transit. But I was very tired by this point. So when I started the CDT with the girls, um, I wasn't in the greatest physical shape and I was feeling a bit wobbly. So we hiked, we hiked a few hundred miles, loved them. It was brilliant. But as you know, I came off. But that was the last time I really shared a hike and being excited about a hike. Nothing stops me being excited about the outdoors generally. But I definitely had my confidence knocked because when I came off the CDT, you will know, I I probably didn't share as much as I feel like I shared, but I was in Alaska. I took a ferry to Alaska because you couldn't travel through Canada, put my tent up on the on the deck of that ferry for three days, met some incredibly interesting people. I met someone who didn't reveal who he was straight away, but he's the um part of the family of Pendleton in the US which make incredible clothes and blankets and have been going the wool factory for like 200 years they're slightly Ralph Lorenny and he was just some fellow with his mate on the three-day ferry with the hunters and the people on the run all the people trying to get to Alaska with their guns to the wilderness Um, and we were all on this small ferry together about 200 people for three nights um, going through the fjords and the sounds through Alaska, through Canada up to Alaska. So that was an amazing adventure. But I was definitely planning, doing up into Denali, then down across Oregon, phoning people I'd met who wanted me to come over, meeting more people, until it was all just a bit too much. And I couldn't understand why I was making all these spiraling crazy plans and not being able to ever achieve all of them. Nobody could. And feeling totally exhausted, but like I could not stop. And that's when I posted on my Instagram and a lot of lovely people said, I think you might have ADHD, Gail. These are all like symptomatic spirals, ups and downs. No, no, no. But of course, I came home, felt wobbly, 
was assessed, went privately, and I've written a bit and shared privately with people who've asked me about how that process worked. I'm very happy to share. Perhaps I should do a little vid like this on that. Anyway, that takes me to me needing to have some time out from being on trails, from sharing what I was doing, had a breakup in in the last six months in that time um, with someone I'm still incredibly fond of and very much in touch with. And it's all fine. But it was a wobbly period of transition. And that's why I haven't been here. But now I'm so back and feel so great. I feel so grateful for everyone who's here, who's stuck with me and who's followed the journey. Because the truth of anybody's journey is that things go wrong. Your heart breaks, you feel insecure all of a sudden, all the steps forward that you've made, you feel like you've gone backwards five of them again. So really, I think that anything that challenges us and sets us back and makes us look at ourselves and the world in a new way, once you've gotten through the difficulty of that, it gives you extra insight, extra um, courage to do it again. So that's what I'm doing. So to summarize, came off trails, had a breakup, moved out of my house and into a caravan, was diagnosed with ADHD, <laughs> waited five months for, to speak to someone about medication for that. So I had a diagnosis, then I had the Google machine for five months until I could speak to a nurse who was a medical nurse with a, like a prescription nurse, psych nurse, which sounds kind of scary, doesn't it, from all the films that we've seen, the psych nurse. Nurse Ratchet, not at all. But it took a long time to get some advice on medication. Then I had to titrate the medication, which I've only recently finished, to make it the right level. So every week you get given a stronger dose of amphetamines, which sounds bonkers, doesn't it? Um, and another day I shall explain to you why people who are quite woo like me actually benefit from amphetamine, even though that sounds totally counterintuitive. Um, it works. So then all of that, and then I took too strong a dose mixed with something else, and then I had a bit of a meltdown, so roller coaster goes around again. But we can thrive, we can cope, we can navigate these things, and here I am now with a good head on my shoulders, a great crew behind me, a wonderful team of two amazing apprentices that I took on in January, um, and I'm so privileged to work with these two amazing people who are both have incredible skill sets, and together we have put an incredible map of this year forward. So on Monday, I start my footpath hike. Um, then when I come back from that, and I'll tell you about that shortly, when I come back from my footpath hike, I then run my second retreat in June, my first retreat in March. You may have seen some of it on Instagram or with Jay Lawley, an incredible filmmaker and photographer, made a lovely film of it that's also here on YouTube. The women were amazing that came. The weather was wonderful. All of the activities were incredible. People had the most brilliant time. Um, I, I couldn't quite believe how magical it was. It was just a combination of people who just all clicked. And I think it's because we all like the same things. We've all met through the same medium and and it's Cornwall, so it's magic anyway. So I'll be running the second one of those in June. Um, I haven't publicly announced that yet for booking, but uh, I sent it out to a really small mailing list. Six places have gone. There's another 14 places, so I'll, I'll talk about that another time. Then I go and hike the Tour du Mont Blanc, which I have tried to hike for the last three years. Um, and it's been cancelled every time. So this year, it's happening. Um, it's all booked, going on my own hiking it on my own um, and that's going to remind me that I can I can do that <laughs> that's not a problem I can go and hike by myself yeah and I can go to another country and do that um, and it's fine even though my brain might be slightly different now uh, with ADHD meds it's actually even better because it means that I'm less likely to not remember that I need to give myself a bit of time between this and this so after the Tour du Mont Blanc then I come home and then we're in July July, the most incredible thing has happened for me. I haven't actually shared this anywhere, and you might not even know what it is. I've been asked to speak at the Do Lectures. The Do Lectures happens every year on a farm in Wales, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say who else is speaking. I'm not sure if I'm allowed. A very well-known person is <laughs> speaking there too, who's very aligned with the things that I'm aligned with and I think she's incredible, so I'm incredibly excited because they limit the attendees to 100 every year. Never is going to grow bigger than 100 and they have thousands of applications. I think it's quite expensive to attend. Um, I think it's like 
thought leaders, I don't know. Um, but and they only have 20 speakers. So it will always remain 100 attendees and around 20 speakers. And you all kind of live together in yurts and you swim together and you all eat together on big trestle tables. And there are 20 speakers over four days that give everyone gives a talk and everyone attends everyone's talk. And then you talk about it in the evening and there's music and like, so it's a festival, but I wanted to go or be a part of it for so long and to be asked to be a part of that has blown my mind. So that's July. And then in August, I'm going back to my beloved Appalachian Trail as part of the Appalachian Trail main crew in Maine obviously, because it's the main Appalachian Trail crew, which is the volunteer organization that maintains the trail in um, the U- in, in Maine. So May- I think I'm getting confused there with the maintain and the main. Every single state along the Appalachian Trail has a volunteer organization that maintains it because it can't be maintained by itself. It's all volunteers that go out, take a piece of trail, make sure that they're clipping it back, that the shelters are clean, that there aren't, there isn't rubbish, that people aren't leaving things behind. There's trail runners that run up and down or walk up and down different parts of the trail, just checking everyone's okay. You don't see them very often, but those volunteers are out there all the time. And when I hiked the AT, I passed so many trail crews and Maine was my first state and it was the biggest shock to my system I think I've ever had in terms of I've never been anywhere like this in my life I've never been this far from civilization from a phone service from a road that can take you out from a shop where you can buy what you want a cold drink I'd never fully appreciated how much we take for granted filtering every single sip of water that I wanted to drink I had to filter it myself find the water source filter the water source drink the filtered water suffocated claustrophobic with with thousands of miles of pine forest in every direction around me and up mountains it was mind-boggling and I can never probably recapture that feeling your first trail or your first piece of fully living in the wilderness um anyway so I passed lots of trail crews way out in the back country and they were chipping bits of stone away moving stones doing all kinds of things that would mean that um, they could keep the trail clear and clean for the hikers coming through. So every single year, the attrition of people walking up and down the trail means that uh, it gets damaged, it gets run down, it gets eroded. So volunteers come for a week, two weeks, they stay at a base and then they hike in or they um, they get flown in in some places to a river or a pond and then they they hike down a trail and they do stuff to keep it good. So I am going to be helping to take blocks of stone and moving them on pulleys and ropes along and up mountain sides and then manoeuvring them into place alongside the trail to help as water buffers, to help run off from floods and to help rebuild stone steps down the sides of mountains like um, Chairback Mountain. Um, and I cannot wait, but I'm a little bit intimidated by that. And I'm going to go with an open heart and an empty brain and say, teach me. I'm here to learn. I'll do whatever you want me to do. So sleeping in hammocks in the backcountry for two weeks. Um, yeah. So that's August. Wow. Uh, I was distracted then by like 10 seagulls having a fight on the roof. And then November is the next time I'm doing anything mega, which is a hike in the Sahara with Copperfield after I'd been to the Himalayas, was fabulous, uh, hiking with Copperfield, giving them a little bit of like trail boost and morale boost, these incredible women that go, I'm doing the same again with G in the Sahara in November. So that's the year. And I'm sure there's other bits that are going to fill in along the way. I was supposed to be again in Ireland this week, right now, doing the Wemsey Mountain Medicine first responder emergency first aid, of course, um, which was super intense. I read the syllabus they sent two weeks ago saying, you know, I'd be doing like, emergency response to lightning strike, ballistic injury, emergency childbirth, splinting, stitching, catastrophic injury. And then they'd have like maneuvers on the mountains at nighttime where you'd go out and there'd be a scene that has happened and you have to deal with it, whatever the weather, based on what you've been learning from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night, seven days a week in the Wicklow Mountains. Two years in a row, but that paid for it, flights, everything, cancelled COVID, understandably. They cancelled it last week for this week because the Irish government had asked all scout huts, guiding huts, youth hostels to cancel all bookings and leave their facilities empty so that they could welcome Ukrainian refugees. So it was an incredibly brilliant reason, but it meant that that's had the kibosh again. But to be honest, I needed the space and time for my footpath hike. And now to the point, 
just wanted to fill you in on what I've been up to. But to the point, which is, I'm hiking the footpaths. I'm hiking the footpaths from Monday. Now, not just any old footpaths. When I hiked the Southwest Coast Path, I was blown away. It's glorious. Even though I've lived here all of my life, it still has the ability to take your breath away. Even if you've seen the same scene a hundred times, a thousand times, the light changes, the weather changes, your mood changes, the, the flora and the fauna change. So Cornwall's coast is utterly incredible. But I did think recently, what about the interior of Cornwall? What about all of the beautiful mining trails, the history, the heritage, the beautiful meadows, the countryside, all of that jazz? No one ever talks about that stuff very much. We need to talk about that more. And then I realised that the government had put that date in, the 2026 January date, which I did write about somewhere. Anywho, that is that if footpaths that are a bit lost, that maybe have grown over or that you can't really access and no one's using or people forgot there was a footpath there, but that may have been there, I don't know, thousand years, if they were not registered, walked, claimed, submitted in a big waffly document to the government site, but and then re-put on a map formally by a government department, by January 2026, they would be devolved back into private land ownership, and they would no longer exist as a private, uh, public right-of-way or footpath. And that incensed me, maybe because as a history teacher, as well as being a passionate outdoors person, and as being somebody who sees with like a network of connections between people and things, the idea that we'd lose our public footpaths appalled me. Um, but then on the other hand, I realised that through lockdown, when everybody jumped into the outdoors because it was helpful for mental health, etc., people weren't treating the countryside nicely. People around here were leaving tents full of stuff, empty on the cliffs. Um, they turn up, they just buy the stuff at wherever and just leave it behind them because it wasn't expensive or they don't value it or they don't know how to get rid of it or they don't care and they're arseholes. Um, so I was thinking, right, well, I know farmers who are pissed right off because cows, um, female cows when they're pregnant, I think Robin actually taught me this, my apprentice, is that if dogs poo in a field, it can contain something that can make uh, cows miscarry or have birth defects in their calves. Um, I've seen people trample over crops. In fact, behind my parents' house up on the hill, um, the back of Mabe, the farmers dug furrows through his field to plant the new crop. And very quickly after he dug the furrows, we would walk right round the edge in the place where you're allowed to walk, footpath. People had walked diagonally across the field and you could see their huge footprints crushing down all the furrows over the seeds. And I just thought to myself, well, I completely understand why farmers would want to think, you know what, I'm not going to make it easy for you to get on my land or walk through my yard or through my field because maybe your dog isn't on a lead and you've bitten the sheep and the sheep's miscarried or whatever it might be. And now my crops are absolutely screwed. So I think there's that idea that um, if there's a footpath, it means that if it's through the middle of a field, you can walk anywhere across that field. Or if the footpath's around the edge, you can just cut across the centre of the field because it's quicker, because it's a footpath anyway. It doesn't work like that, but we don't know. Talk to kids in school, talk to the teacher, they don't know. Talk to friends, adults, they don't know. I went and hiked somewhere with a really close bunch of amazing girlfriends recently, and then I saw banana skin, um, and I went, oh, someone's left that behind by accident and picked it up, and one of them said, oh, no, that was me. I was thinking maybe I, maybe it's biodegradable. And I said, no, 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 it's not. So, and they were like, oh, God, right, let's take it. Thank you. So I realised that there's lots of stuff people just don't know about closing gates, about the countryside code, because the government stopped funding teaching things like how to treat the countryside. So you've got two things in opposition there. You've got the political football of me walking through footpaths, especially lost paths, which is my plan, talking about how they connect communities. And then you've got the people I'll be speaking to who might feel pretty resistant to people knowing that that footpath's there because they feel not sure that people are going to treat their land well. So I think I'm not going to delve into that on my hike every day, but I think it's something that I had at the back of my mind that I think it's important for us to know how our communities were born, why we are the way we are and where we are. But it's also important as I go to talk about how we treat our countryside, things that might seem obvious if you grew up somewhere 
in the countryside and know all of this stuff. But if you're Sam and you come from, you know, somewhere in inner city Bristol or you come from Birmingham and you come to Cornwall because you love it and you've not spent much of your life in the outdoors, why would you know to close a gate behind you if it was already open when you walked up to it? You might not. You might just think, oh, and you walk through. So my footpath hike is around showcasing the footpaths of Cornwall, talking about our history, and also trying to bring to front of mind through my socials, through the schools I'm going to stop and talk to along the way, the glories of our countryside, plus how we can best love it, how we don't love it to death, how we love it so it thrives without being patronizing, condescending, telling people they're dicks because they didn't do this or that, or don't you fucking do anything, shouting at people because they didn't close the gate. There's got to be a way to share information in a really upbeat, positive, jolly way. And that's what I hope to do. And the history aspect. It blows my mind that all these footpaths we walk and don't think about it every day. That's where our ancestors, or not directly ancestors, our cultural ancestors, if they're not by blood, they hunted along them, they married people they met along them, they traded from one village to the next. Those footpaths we walk every day are where fights happen, battles have worship happened, fish and and livestock were moved up and traded up to other cities, um, messages about the armada were spread, defences were sent to London, people lost their lives over whispers that were spread across these footpaths that joined village to village to village, which then became village to town, which became village to town to city. And we, uh, we've we expanded and we we exist on this land where we do because of a network of footpaths that's allowed us to thrive and breathe between all of these communities. And now we have paths and we have roads, and we don't have the time to walk them. So I'm going to walk them. I'm going to dig up the stories. I'm going to tell you about Poltesco Pilchard Factory, Pilchard, Pilchard Factory on the Lizard Peninsula, and how people ran up to the headlands to look for the Pilchard at sea and then sent the alarm and the fishermen would come in and where the fish went. And I'm going to talk to you about sending boats up the river. I'm going to talk to the people at Goon Hilly Earth Station about how we can marry cutting edge science based technology with the GPS that allows us to find the lost footpath through the apps that we use and keep us safe in the outdoors and allow us to preserve and protect it and help farming, linking together conservation, preservation, history, and cutting edge tech. I'm going to interview my auntie at Anne's Pasties and record a pasty making lesson. I'm going to speak to fishermen, lifeboat coxswains, regenerative farmers, surfers in their 80s who are here at the very birth of Cornish surfing and how the scene has changed. I'm going to speak to seaweed collectors. I'm going to speak to fishermen, crab potmen, people who make their own crab pots. And I'm going to share the beauty of Cornwall while sharing these stories with you. Just because I love it and because for me, you can't appreciate things as, not that you can't, it's easier to appreciate things and look after them if you understand the rich heritage and the reasons why things are the way they are. We don't exist in a tiny slice of time. We are part of a huge tapestry that stretches back and hopefully stretches forward. So we need to feel our place in that tapestry rather than feel like we are a blip and we're gone. We're not. And I want to talk about that. So that's what I'll be doing starting Monday. And we're going to make a film. I've got a great producer, award-winning producer, an incredible editor. We're just getting a... um, a cameraman, self-shooting cameraman director on board. And for the first seven or eight days, which will take me from St. Agnes across to Carnmarth, across back into Falmouth, down to the Helford, across through the Lizard Peninsula, and then back up down to Rinsey, et cetera, Port 11, and in that direction. For those first eight days, we're going to talk mining. We're going to talk Monaconite. Did you know that titanium was first discovered in Monacan on the Helford? And it was called Monaconite. And then they changed its name, it became titanium, and then they found it in lots of other places. But it was first called Monaconite. I'm going to go there to the little mine where it was first discovered. Monaconite It's where my dad grew up, Monacan, over the river. Yeah. I probably haven't breathed in for 28 minutes, 29 minutes, 20 seconds. But this is exciting, and I'm so excited to have shared it with you. Now, I'm going to do a QA and a in a minute over on my Patreon. Well, it's the same thing. It's, a, it's one of these, but it's like for my patrons. 
Patreon is what helped me be able to fund to do these things. And I've got about 30 incredible patrons uh, pay, giving me maybe between one pound a month, two pounds a month, up to 20 pounds a month um, to help fund my school talks, the time it takes to create stuff, to write stuff, to, to begin this kind of journey. So if you wanted to join Patreon and pop into the Q&A, you can. If you want to look at that and think about it in the future, you can. If you don't ever want to look at it at all, I'm still here doing this stuff. So that's absolutely fine, too. If you had any other questions, drop them in the box below. Um, will you be following along the footpath hike? The film will come out a bit later, but I'll also be sharing on YouTube every two to three days. Um, I'm gonna send M the footage and they're gonna edit it days one to three, and then it will go on here of the, of the hike. I'll be on my Instagram. My Instagram, it's like an old person saying Instagram. Be on me Instagram and uh, on my YouTubes and then I'll also be on my Facebook but mostly I'll be on Instagram, YouTube and doing lives on here I think why not do a live on here every couple of evenings um, to fill you in on what bonkers things have happened that day plus Bill yeah hiking with Bill who I can't I don't want to call Bill Murray at the moment because Bill Murray's been cancelled apparently let's wait and see what happens with that I hope you haven't done anything too bad but otherwise I think the deep old change the dog's name to John Candy, I think is the next option. I'm not sure how long it's going to take him to get used to being called John Candy. Otherwise, he's just going to have to be Bill, no last name. That's a story for another day. Okay, I'm so grateful that you were here. It, this was not as nerve-wracking as I thought because I just felt like I was talking to you over a coffee. So that didn't make me feel so nervous. And I haven't heard you say anything. I didn't see you yawn because I can't see your face. I also didn't see you go... Yeah, that's boring. Let's click into something else. So I'm absolutely delighted. Yeah. Oh, M's just put down below. Lives will be every Tuesday on Instagram and Thursday on YouTube. I'm not very good at organizing my diary. M's amazing assets. So thanks, M. Um, so thanks, Karen. Thank you that you sound like the, the, the journey sounds like it's going to be good. Thanks for coming with me on the, all of you, on the emotional journey that I've been through. And also just... The fact that we never stop learning, do we? We think we've kind of got it together. And on the outside, sometimes we can really look like shit's good. And actually, things can be really tough for all of us at any given moment. So it's good that we all try and be kind to each other. And I think I don't mind saying that I wasn't very good for a while. And I wouldn't have gotten through it without my mum and dad, who are literally the most incredible people on earth and I love them so friggin much and my sister Nikki who's my inspiration and always has been um such an incredible woman and also all my mates you know people pull together so don't ever be afraid to reach out to me if anybody who's watching this ever needs to ask advice or questions about any of the things I might know something about because I had to do that to other people and it helped me get through so I think we all lift each other up what do they say a rising tide lifts all boats. So up we go, gang. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the trail. And I need to start posting on my Instagram grid. I don't know about reels. I'm going to start getting into reels. If you see one of my reels, give it a like. Because, uh, you know, I've got to figure out editing and stuff. Haven't I? I can do it. I'll smash it. Do anything. Okay, I'm going to hop over to Patreon now. Lots of love to you. I hope you have a really good um, rest of the evening. And thanks for being there for me and turning up and watching when I asked you to. Um, I've just seen that, you know, there's been between like 12 and 17 of you on here for this whole 33 minutes. And I love you for it. It means ever such a lot. Thanks. And uh, be in touch. Send me messages. Send me an email. Tell me what you want me to talk about and what you want to know. And I'll let you know. Thank you. Bye.